Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. So I don't know if the conditions today are gonna to work for us or against us, as you can see, it's really claggy. It's, we're actually fairly high up where we are today starting this walk. So it's not really like, gosh, man, I'm stuck in this gate. Oh, this is a nightmare. Just tried to film a nice little bit for you. <sighs> yes, anyway, as I was saying, it's not really foggy as such. We're just quite high up and we're in all this low cloud. <laughs> but yeah, I'm sure you'll agree. At the very least, it's really atmospheric. So as always, I'm gonna try and work with the conditions. Now, I wanna talk about um, the first mistake that I suppose that I used to make as a landscape photographer, something that I definitely don't do anymore. And this is a really good one to start with because it's actually got nothing to do with photography out and about on location. So you're probably thinking, what on earth did you used to do that you don't do anymore? Like, what mistake did you used to make if it wasn't when you're out on location? And it is all to do with post-processing. So I sort of want to get this one out of the way because we're not going to be doing any post-processing in today's video. Um, and this one is more specifically the mistake of over-processing your photographs. Now, this is something that I think it's actually quite easy to do, especially at the start. And in a way, it's kind of acceptable in the sense that you're just experimenting, you're playing around. But I remember, to be even more specific in post-processing, I was mad to oversaturate my photographs. You know, that saturation slider and the vibrant slider were just flying to the right. And I just liked how, I suppose, eye-catching it made my photographs look. But here's the thing, I think, you know, when it's done too much, it can just look a little bit sickly, not true to life. And in fact, nowadays, I will actually generally desaturate my photographs in post-production a little bit because I can find too much color can actually be really distracting, you know? And I find that little bit of desaturation as well just brings it back to reality <laughs> a little bit, if you will. And yeah, like I say, it's not just saturation, it goes for any type of over-processing, you know, adding too much contrast, over-sharpening your photographs. And I reckon now, I probably spend an average of five to 10 minutes on each photograph. Not saying that that's how long I spend on all of them, but as an average, um, you know, I really don't spend ages post-processing my photographs anymore. Now, of course, part of this comes down to style. You know, there's definitely no right or wrong, and that goes for anything that I talk about in today's video. You might want to spend ages post-processing your photographs, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But I do think there's a common mistake that a lot of photographers, a lot of landscape photographers make in that they over-process the photographs. They spend too long with their images in the post-processing software. And yeah, things can just look, end up looking a little bit sickly. Now let's get ourselves up into all of this clag. This is a cool location today. I'm feeling good. Man, this is so mad. So as I've started making my way up this fell side, for the most part, we were just coming into this clag, into the low cloud, and it was really atmospheric and spooky and sinister. Whereas now you could probably see in the background, it's all gone, man. It's completely cleared. We've had a little bit of wind coming in from the west, and it's just moved it all on. Um, but I've managed to get a photograph whilst we were in the midst of those spooky conditions and I'll get onto it in a second. Um, it's a very good example, I think, of mistake number two that I used to make. I think I used to make it quite a lot that I perhaps don't do um, as much anymore. And that is feeling like you always need to use foregrounds in your landscape photographs. Now, first things first, foregrounds are brilliant. I probably use foregrounds in my landscape photographs the majority of the time. You know, the, the classic traditional landscape photograph, I guess, would generally be seen as a wide angle image with foreground and mid-ground and background with a lot of depth that would be sharp from front to back. And that is all brilliant. But my point is, there's a lot more to landscape photography, you know, think abstract 
photographs with no foreground at all, intimate photographs with no, no foreground at all, you know. Um, it's not all just about foreground, midground, background all the time, you know. And I'm hoping that this photograph, like I said, is going to be a decent example of that. It's quite abstract, it's a bit of a Marmite photograph in that you're either going to love it or you're going to hate it. I'm zoomed in about 200 mil and what we've got or what we did have were a couple of trees really sort of intertwined with each other in the midst of all that clag. And I've just honed in on them, square crop, black and white, focused on the trees, so, so simple. And it just felt, to me at least, really spooky. And like I said, sinister. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get that emotion across, but there's no real foreground in the image at all. And it certainly isn't one of those, you know, classic traditional landscape photographs. So yeah, I think that's a really good one to remember. It's a mistake that is very common, feeling like you have to have foreground in your images all the time. And certainly don't just be chucking foreground down there just for the sake of it. It's, it's just gone so clear since that clag has moved out. In fact, I'm just looking now, it looks like it might be on its way back in. Conditions are quite changeable. It probably shows how important it is to be adaptable as landscape photographers, isn't it? Really adaptable to the changing conditions and the changing light. Now, before I move on, I want to talk about mistake number three that I definitely used to make a lot and I definitely don't make at all anymore. And that is um, having a, a fear or a, an adversity to increasing your ISO. Now you'll always hear, won't you? Um, start at your base ISO, shoot at ISO 100 or whatever the base is on your camera. Don't increase your ISO. Now for the most part, especially if you're using a tripod like I do most of the time, that's great advice. It's true, you don't need to increase your ISO a lot of the time, but sometimes you do. Firstly, if you're not using a tripod and you want to increase your ISO, just do it man, just do that. Don't be scared of increasing your ISO. That is the general message with this mistake. But even when you're using a tripod, a lot of the time, you will find instances when you need to increase your ISO. Now I don't think I'm gonna get any examples of it today, but it's all to do with movement in a scene. You know, say you're shooting a waterfall, you wanna capture the movement of the water. You need a very specific shutter speed, say one quarter of a second. You put your shutter speed on one quarter of a second. You've got your aperture at f11, whatever it may be. And your image is too dark. You know, you don't want to change your aperture because you'll affect the depth of field. You don't want to change your shutter speed because you'll affect the way that the water looks. So you have to increase your ISO to make your image brighter. Just do it. That is what I'm trying to say. Do not be scared to increase your ISO. My first camera was a Nikon D3100 and that was released in what, 2010? And even that was all right to like ISO 6400, you know? Um, just don't be scared to do it. Think about the priority that you're going for. In that scenario that I just mentioned, the priority would be shutter speed. So that's why the ISO is there. Use it, it's a tool. Don't be scared to increase the ISO. You know, if you're getting up to like ISO 25,000 odd, maybe that's acceptable. You'll start getting a lot of grain in your photographs, a lot of noise. Um, but yeah, don't be scared of it. It's there, it's another setting that is there to be used and to be manipulated. Right, we've got out into the open a little bit now. We've got a load of beautiful silver birch trees up on this fell side here. I'm hoping that I can try and make some use of them and let's see if we can find some sort of composition. <laughs> So I do think I've found another photograph here that is gonna be a good example of another one of these mistakes. So we'll get on to mistake number four in a second. It's a bit more, a little bit more of a complex one. But before we do, I wanna say another massive thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring 
today's video. I'm very, very grateful for their support. And if you've never heard of them, Squarespace are an all-in-one platform that you can use to build your own website, which is what I did. My Squarespace website is something that I'm really proud of. And I had no experience in web development or anything like that, which I think is testament to how easy it is to make your own website through Squarespace. Trust me on that one. And they've got plenty of templates that you can use to get yourself up and running. And then of course you can make a good few edits to those templates along the way to really make that website your own, you know, really get that dream website. Another thing that Squarespace offer are e-commerce packages, e-commerce subscriptions, which means that you can sell stuff through your website, which is of course what I do. I sell my prints, my eBooks, my calendars. I advertise my one-to-one -one workshops all through my Squarespace, web, Squarespace website, and I wouldn't be able to run my business without it. Um, they've also got brilliant customer service as well. Absolutely wonderful. But if I'm being honest, you probably won't need to use it <laughs> because it is that easy. Um, to build your own website through them. Um, so another massive thank you to them. If you'd like to give them a go, head over to squarespace.com forward slash Henry Turner and be sure to use the offer code Henry Turner at checkout to get yourselves 10% off your first purchase. Brilliant. So I want to get into this photograph now because like I said, it's a mistake that I used to make that I don't think I make that much anymore. In fact, just as I've said that, I've realized that might be a little bit contentious. So let's talk about mistake number four. And this one is all about the misuse of negative space. So we'll get onto the mistake a little bit more in depth in a second, but I'll just quickly run you through this composition that I'm going for here. It's another simple one. We've got some birch trees on the left-hand side and everything sort of leads us out into Morecambe Bay to Arnside in the background. We've got some nice clouds up there as well. But what's interesting here is this area in the bottom right of the composition, this gravel path. So remember that. <laughs> I'm gonna take the camera off the tripod here so that I can show you a little bit in a little bit more detail. Um, but first things first, let's talk about what negative space is. Um, as, a, as a real rudimentary definition, uh, negative space in a composition are the areas that do not contain any subjects or elements. So basically areas of sort of open, space and we can use negative space as photographers to our advantage you know it can really help us to simplify a scene it can help us to give balance to a composition and and that's probably what i'm doing with this photograph here using it as balance so i'll try and show you this particular image that i'm going for here i'll just shoot this one handheld but you could see again a lot of weight on the left hand side with the silver birch trees and then this bottom right quarter here is probably what I'd like you to focus on. This is, I would say, almost negative space. And why I say almost is because I think it serves a purpose. We've got this gravel path that is the purpose is. It's leading us deeper into the scene, into the photograph. Whereas if the path wasn't here and it, it was all just grass, you know, then to me, it would just be a big waste of space, a big waste of negative space but you can see it's quite a big area here that is helping us to balance the left hand side of the image and that's you know that's your decision as a photographer you've got to decide if these open spaces are actually helping are they adding anything to the photograph at all or is it because you're just becoming so fixated on a subject that you're forgetting about these open areas and that is the absolute crux of the mistake in my opinion is that you can become so fixated on an attractive subject or an attractive scene that you forget to actually you know compose you forget to compose your photograph and you just end up with these big blank spaces that are there for no reason there's a big difference between you know photographing something that's pretty and actually composing a photograph it's the composition element that in my opinion makes us photographers so Nice and simple. I'll just shoot this handheld for the crack. <laughs> Rule of thirds, just a little bit of the sky up there. I'll focus on that sort of first silver birch tree there. And then as you can see, hopefully, I'll grab that now. Uh, as you can see, the path, the bottom right of the frame is leading us. It's taking us deeper into the scene. And thus, like I've said, it serves a purpose. So yeah, have a good think about negative space when you're next out composing some photographs. It is really, really important. Brilliant. Let's move on and we'll get on to mistake number five and see if we can find maybe one more photograph. 
So I have photographed this tree before. Ooh, look how cool he is, man. Look how cool my old head's ruining it a little bit, is it not? <laughs> I'll show you. Um, there we go, him. Look what a cool tree. Uh, I'll put the image that I photographed up on the screen there. Uh, I think it's called Perseverance. I liked the idea that the tree looks like it's in just constant survival mode, man. But um, I was just thinking about this then because I want to talk about the fifth mistake now. Um, the fifth mistake that I used to make all the time, if I just get in focus, is um, a lack of patience. Now, this one is, I mean, firstly, you hear, hear this one all the time. And I think rightly so, because it's so important. But I think there's a lot of layers to this patience. When I used to hear it, or oh, you've got to have patience in landscape photography, I used to think that was always referring to the light and the conditions. So you're stood with your camera on the tripod and you've got to wait for the light. Now, that is really important. And that in itself is something to bear in mind. But where I think I've always failed is a different kind of patience, a long-term patience, let's call it. And this tree made me think of it. You know, this area is all fairly local to me. And I've always wanted to come back to this tree at different times of year, you know, and see how different that scene looks. Um, I've always felt that I could better it. And I think that long-term type of patience is so important in landscape photography. You know, um, it could take years to get a photograph that you're after. Sometimes it might take, you know, like weeks, which is still a long time if you're, I've done it myself, where I keep going back to like woodlands, for example, um, finding compositions and then just waiting for the right conditions, whether it's fog or really nice light in the morning. And that sort of, I guess it's like a bit of a general patient, I think, is really important. What do you think, mate? It is, isn't it? Um, I'm going to go home, you know. I'm not feeling it <laughs> that much today, if I'm being honest with you. Um, so, probably not the best couple of photographs, but yeah, I just oh, fancy going home, man. Yeah. It's not really like me, that, is it? But anyway, um, I've got some e-books if you want to check them out. I've spoke about composition quite a lot today. I've had good feedback off them. One's about Lake District locations and the other one's helping with composition. But um, I'll put a link up in the corner, I'll put it in the video description below. Good way to support me as well if you'd like to support my work. Anyway, um, I shall see you on the next adventure. Thank you so much for your support. And uh, yeah, hope you enjoyed today's video. Out! Mm -hmm.